Hello, everyone. It is welcome. To, it is wonderful to see this great house on such uh, an important anniversary, the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, which is, Mr. Sloan, the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And that beautiful nonpartisan mandate, which has inspired so many of you to recite it in your sleep, is, um, has never been more beautifully served than by the uh, initiative that we're celebrating tonight. The post-Civil War amendments to the US Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, turn 150 over the next five years. And this year is the 150th anniversary of the proposal of the 14th Amendment. And when I teach constitutional laws, all of you uh, who study it as citizens know, so many of the questions that transfix our national life today come back to the interpretation of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment says, I can't do the whole thing uh, by heart, but this is a, the gist of it. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. And then the crucial words, no state shall uh, make or enforce any law which shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. And that transforms the Constitution. Um, Jefferson promises in the Declaration that all men are created equal. The original Constitution with the stain of slavery violates that promise. Madison wants the original Constitution to forbid the states as well as the federal government from abridging these basic rights. And it takes the bloodiest war in American history, the Civil War, uh, Lincoln's promise at Gettysburg, and finally the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to make that a reality. So, there couldn't be a more important second founding to commemorate, and we are commemorating it with the help of the National Endowment for the, from the Humanities. Uh, the National Endowment um, has this wonderful initiative which is aimed at fostering meaningful dialogue in communities across the country. Uh, the NEH believes that the perspectives of the humanities, history, literature, and philosophy, can be brought to bear on our current challenges and help us understand the, comp the context and complexity of these issues and we're so thrilled that they're supporting this beautiful second founding initiative all year and into the future. We have two blockbuster panels. And the first one is moderated by our superb partner in this second founding initiative, uh, the Constitutional Accountability Center, led by uh, the visionary uh, and wonderful Elizabeth Wydra. So the Constitutional Accountability Center is a group that is dedicated to the proposition that constitutional text and history when uh, studied carefully, can lead to progressive as well as conservative results. And it's part of a movement uh, uh, in the country, in the scholarly community that is making these arguments. And Elizabeth, under her leadership, the organization is just being taken to new heights. She was previously chief counsel of the Constitutional Accountability Center. She came from uh, private practice in San Francisco. She represents uh, the Constitutional Accountability Center before the Supreme Court. She, you, you've seen her on uh, TV and in print, and she is just doing a superb job. It's important uh, for Elizabeth and me to let you know that this second founding initiative was the brainchild of the late Doug Kendall, the former head of the Constitutional Accountability Center. This great visionary uh, leader who we miss so much, who, who passed away last year, thought that it was important for Americans of different perspectives to celebrate the uh, Reconstruction Amendments, and we're all here because of his vision. So Elizabeth is moderating, and you have this incredible panel of scholars to discuss uh, the history and contemporary meaning of the 14th Amendment. Dr. Alan Gelzo is Director of Civil War Studies and the Henry R. Luce Professor of the Civil War era at Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. He's one of the most important scholars of Reconstruction in America, author of most recently Redeeming the Great Emancipator, also of Abraham Lincoln, Redeemer President, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, The End of Slavery in America. He's been here and everyone who has heard him knows how riveting and learned he is. We have another, two other return uh, champions. Uh, Gerard Magliocca is Samuel R. Rosen, 
excellent name, uh, although no relation, professor at the Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law. He's the author of the definitive biography of John Bingham. And as you'll learn, John Bingham is the James Madison of Reconstruction. He's the uh, representative who drafts the 14th Amendment, forgotten for almost a century, and Gerard, in his wonderful book, resurrects this great American founder. And uh, finally, the superb uh, Theodore Shaw is Julius L. Chambers, distinguished professor of law and director of the Center for Civil Rights at the University of North Carolina School of Law at Chapel Hill. He was the fifth director, counsel, and president of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Among his many achievements, he's contributed the Equal Protection Clause explainer on the interactive Constitution, at, which you can see at constitutioncenter.org. And we are so honored to have him. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Wydra, Alan Gelzo, Gerard Maglioka, and Ted Shaw. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to all of you for being with us tonight. Um, it is really lovely to be here, to be celebrating this second founding, um, not just because I, like you, I assume since you're here, share a love of the Constitution, but also because it is the legacy that my former boss, mentor, and friend uh, really started. Doug Kendall's vision for the second founding commemoration is wonderfully realized tonight and here with uh, all of you and with our wonderful partnership with the National Constitution Center. So thank you again, Jeff, for having us all here tonight. Um, we at the Constitutional Accountability Center love the whole Constitution, but I confess I have a special place in my heart for the 14th Amendment. And I am not the only one. In 1866, Schuyler Colfax, Speaker of the House of Representatives, called Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, which you heard Jeff read some words of uh, just a moment ago, he called Section 1 the gem of the Constitution. The gem of the Constitution, because it places immutably and forever the Declaration of Independence in the Constitution. Before the Reconstruction Amendments, as Jeff alluded to in his opening remarks, it is difficult to say that our Constitution lived up to the Declaration of Independence, our founding manifesto of freedom and liberty and equality. Because how could our national charter live up to that when you had a constitution that sanctioned the institution of slavery? Now, the 13th Amendment did a lot of the work of pulling our nation's charter back into line with the ideals of the Declaration of Independence by abolishing the institution of slavery. But the 13th Amendment really begged the question, what does it mean to be free under America's constitution? And the 14th Amendment goes a long way to answering that question. It says in section one, equal citizenship at birth, whether your parents were rich or poor, saint or sinner, whether they came over on the Mayflower or were brought in bondage on a slave ship, equal citizenship at birth. It guarantees due process of law for your life, liberty, or property. I guess we sort of did away with the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration. Property is a little more, I guess, concrete. Um, uh, so, but all those things together lead to the pursuit of happiness, one would argue. And then it guaranteed importantly, and importantly in today's debates, equal protection under the law for all persons. All persons. That includes persons of any color, persons of any creed, citizen or stranger. So these words are echoes of the Declaration of Independence. But while we know very much about the author of the Declaration of Independence, we don't talk as much about John Bingham, who was the architect of the 14th Amendment. Now, he hasn't quite gotten the Lin-Manuel Miranda Hamilton musical treatment yet, although I'm sure there's a good case for that. But there is a wonderful book written about him by our wonderful panelist here tonight, Professor Magliaca. So I wanted to turn it to you first and ask you to tell us a little bit about John Bingham, the Ohio congressman, who, as you talk about, um, is the architect of the 14th Amendment. Well, thanks for coming. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, John Bingham was an anti-slavery congressman from Ohio uh, who served both before the Civil War, during, and after, and was one of the leaders of the anti-slavery movement in the Republican Party. 
Uh, he became particularly noteworthy as one of the prosecutors of the assassins of President Lincoln. And uh, after that was done and Congress was taking up the question of what to do after the Civil War with the ex-Confederate states, he became the leading advocate for a constitutional solution that involved guaranteeing fundamental rights to all Americans in the language that Jeff quoted. He fought extremely hard for that language in the committee of Congress that had to take up these questions. He had it taken out many times and put it back in and kept insisting that it had to be in there and that really the 14th Amendment was something that was vital for the nation's future. He was a serious man. He was a sort of perseverant, one might say stubborn man. Uh, and it's sort of an unheralded role uh, that he played in part because he died in obscurity, kind of broke. And uh, it's really only in recent years, especially after the civil rights movement in the 1960s, that we've started to look differently at the men who led Reconstruction and played a role in putting the 14th Amendment uh, together. Uh, and so he, he really did play this sort of pivotal role in sort of shaping what America was going to look like after the Civil War, and the 14th Amendment was a big part of that. So I, I won't have you do a you know freestyle hip hop rap about uh, John Bingham, but you know if you're so moved later, if anyone so wants to write know, one, I'm, I'm happy to you know help um, out. Yeah, you can put it on a little card that they're gonna ask. Um, so uh, in drafting the Fourteenth Amendment, um, you know one of the things that I find really interesting is that there was this um, consideration of how broadly or how narrowly to write it. Um, you know there were proposals. Um, in the drafting committee to limit the 14th Amendment's focus to specifically discrimination on the basis of race. Obviously, we are in the context of um, the post-Civil War era, um, but those, those more specific proposals were rejected. And Professor Shaw, you wrote in your explainer for the Equal Protection Clause uh, for the National Constitution Center about this duality, the idea that you have a sweepingly worded 14th Amendment um, that does cover equal protection of the laws for all persons. But yet, it's clearly in its original purpose and its intention focused on discrimination on the basis of race. Can you speak a little bit more about that duality and how you think it shapes uh, the 14th Amendment? Sure. Um, this issue of the duality of the 14th Amendment is one that has echoed down through the years. Uh, and it's very much a part of the jurisprudential debate that continues uh, even in 2016. Um, so the duality, um, as we know, goes like this. Uh, you've just touched on it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the purpose, uh, unquestionably the purpose, of the 14th Amendment was to put those who had just come out of slavery on equal footing uh, with uh, white citizens. Um, now, I say that, but uh, we have to drop a quick footnote. Actually, it's worth a whole lot more than a footnote. The 14th Amendment uh, didn't do a whole lot for women. Uh, it was really uh, about black men uh, more than anything else, although it did give citizenship to anyone born in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, but with respect to equality, the 14th Amendment didn't do a whole lot of work uh, that had to wait until the 19th Amendment with respect to women. Uh, so um, uh, the 14th Amendment clearly, though, was about African Americans. Uh, and if you look at the first case that interpreted or applied the 14th Amendment, of course, uh, the slaughterhouse cases, which had nothing on its face to do with race, uh, in um, the opinion, uh, you find the statement that, uh, uh, on the part of the um, justice who wrote the opinion, that this is, uh, I doubt that the, this amendment will ever be about anything more uh, than those who have come out of slavery. How wrong he was. Mm -hmm. uh, and the language of the 14th Amendment, of course, um, is clearly not limited 
uh, to African Americans or to race. Uh, it talks about uh, equal protection of the laws. Uh, that applies to everybody. Um, we could get into a long and deep conversation about uh, what it took to rehabilitate the 14th Amendment because it was almost dead on arrival in terms of its effectiveness as a vehicle for protecting African Americans from racial discrimination. And the amendment itself was used, as we know, for a long period, uh, most notably in the Lochner era, uh, to protect um, you know, business, uh, to protect other interests. Um, before the 14th Amendment had life uh, breathed back into it, uh, in 1954, actually beginning in the 1940s. Um, so uh, I often talk about the duality of the 14th Amendment being uh, perhaps uh, as evident as anywhere else uh, in the Supreme Court's 1978 decision in Bakke, uh, in which the Supreme Court basically through the constitutional remedial rationale, as I put it, under the bus, to use colloquial language. Um, uh, and uh, ever since then, it's been very difficult to interpret the 14th Amendment uh, in a way that really gives it the kind of vitality that many people think it ought to be given. One more thing on this. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to read the 14th Amendment in conjunction with the 13th Amendment. Not everybody sees that. Not everybody agrees with that. Uh, but I uh, would make a case, and others uh, have also talked about this, uh, of uh, kind of two 14th Amendments. The 14th Amendment that applies to everybody, and the 14th Amendment that was meant uh, to apply to the special condition of African Americans, which has kind of the 13th Amendment inside of it. Uh, if uh, that makes sense. Um, but this is a duality that we continue to wrestle with in our jurisprudence, even down to the present, including in the Fisher case that's up in the Supreme Court this term uh, with respect to admissions to uh, selective institutions of higher education. Mm -hmm. And I certainly want to get to the, the current uh, litigation disputes over the 14th Amendment, but um, you know, I think there's something interesting that I want to uh, keep focused on in what you said was this reading it together with the 13th Amendment. You know, again, certainly um, the 13th Amendment is written broadly in that it abolishes slavery. Um, but the idea of uh, getting rid of the badges and incidents of slavery were, of course, more meaningful for African Americans in our country than for any other group of people. So you're exactly right that, you know, while you have a broadly worded amendment, just as with the 14th Amendment, um, the 13th Amendment clearly has. Um, that dual purpose and intention. Um, and I think reading them together with the 14th Amendment, with the 13th Amendment, you know, the 13th Amendment is so often thought of as Lincoln's Amendment. Um, and Professor Gelzo, you are a scholar of Lincoln, um, an expert on Lincoln, and you've written about the Civil War and Reconstruction. And can you place for us the 14th Amendment in that broader context? Well, first, I, I have to admit that as I sat here, I was inspired to write a hip-hop lyric. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> for, um, for John Bingham. Um, and, and it goes like this. <clears throat> John Bingham hated slavery. He fought with verve and bravery. He wanted men of every hue to have what was to each man do. He wrote the 14th Amendment. He urged us to improvement. And we remember him today because he showed us all the way. Bravo. Right you you want a copy of that? Yeah. <laughs> I, do. Oh. I do, but right now is when you're supposed to drop the mic. Yeah, oh, exactly. Right. <laughs> I, think our, I think our poor uh, person who has to re-mic the other group might not be happy about it. <laughs> well, you didn't even have to pay $4,000 a piece for a ticket to get that. <laughs> you just got that right here. Good job. Well, the, the 14th Amendment, along with the 13th and 15th, are often referred to as the Reconstruction Amendments. And I think that of the three of them, the 14th, certainly is very, very critical. I don't want to say the most critical because you really have to begin with the 13th. The 13th has to get rid of slavery. The question then becomes, once you've got rid of slavery, what Lincoln called the king's cure for the evil 
of slavery. Once you've got the 13th Amendment in place, then what? All right, we've gotten rid of slavery, we've abolished slavery, now the slaves are free. What does free mean? And Reconstruction was going to be the time period in which that got hammered out. And it has to get hammered because there's no guidebook available for how to do a reconstruction. There's no reconstruction for dummies you, know, you can get in the bookstore. So there's no handbook, there's no process. This is what you have to do, take this step, this step, this step. It's all a question of, well, what do we do now? And in a way, Reconstruction has to be seen from the perspective of the people on the ground as really one great big improv. Mm. Because they fix a problem, and then another problem bursts out. All right, then we're going to fix that. Oh, but then we've got to fix this other. Right at the opening of the Congress that assembled immediately after the end of the Civil War, in December of 1865, Thaddeus Stevens was on his feet right away. He wanted to talk about a civil rights bill. Because Stevens understood right away that 13th Amendment is great, but that's not far enough. We've got to look at equality of rights, not just an equality of free status. But how do you pass legislation like that when the Constitution really doesn't give you any, any handle for it? The Constitution doesn't talk about equal citizenship, because the Constitution doesn't define citizenship. Mm -hmm. uh, there are four references to citizenship in the Constitution, but they don't really define what it is. So, all right, now we've got to define what a citizen is, because the one person who did step forward before the Civil War to define what citizenship was, was Roger Tawney in Dred Scott. It was as though Tawney had said, well, you know, you people in the Congress, you people in the executive branch, you haven't managed to settle this question about slavery, so we on the court, we're going to do it. And we're going to do it through Dred Scott. And Dred Scott simply said, okay, we know what citizenship is, and black people can't be citizens. Can't, are incapable of citizenship. It's what we would call, if I can be technical for a moment, the jus sanguinis. You know, law according to blood, law according to birth. You become a citizen because you're entitled to do that because of, of, uh, of your parents, or your lineage, or your descent, or your ethnicity. How to get around that? Mm -hmm. That's the first challenge. And Thaddeus Stevens' first instinct was, well, let's pass a civil rights bill. Lyman Trumbull introduces a civil rights bill. John Bingham won't sign on to that because Bingham it's not because he wasn't sympathetic, it's because Bingham recognizes, wait a minute, we're going to have to do something constitutional first. Because we can't talk about equal citizenship until we've defined citizenship. So that critical first section of the 14th Amendment is a way to answer the question posed by the 13th Amendment. If everyone's free, then what does it mean to be free? Free attaches to whom? All right, it attaches to citizens. Right, what's a citizen? So the 14th Amendment reaches out to establish what citizenship is. Now, having done that, they will have to go on to the 15th Amendment, because after you've said that citizenship is a national phenomenon and it obeys the use solus. In other words, if you're born in the United States, you're a citizen. It's not based on your race, it's not based on your ethnicity, it's not based on where your parents came from. It's based on the fact that you're born in the United States. That, of course, would include every slave. So anyone who had been a slave, who is now free, would also, by virtue of the fact of having been born in the United States, be a citizen. Of course, that then is going to yield to another question, and that is, great, now we know what a citizen looks like. What does a citizen do? Does citizenship include voting? Does it include other kinds of civil transactions? Marriage, does it include that? Constitution didn't say, 13th Amendment didn't say, 14th Amendment didn't say, so okay, let's move on to a 15th Amendment, which does in fact specify voting rights as being linked to citizenship. But it really becomes improv as one by one, 
the members of Congress have to come to grips with the questions that are raised. So you look at the amendments, and from our perspective, we look at them and say, well, sure, right, that's perfectly obvious. But it wasn't then. They had to work through and, and work in the face of a hostile president, Andrew Johnson. They had to work through this step by step. And it, if it sometimes seems very gradual and very torturous, it was because they didn't have any guidance. They were, they were feeling their way legally and constitutionally. And it seems to me that actually makes the Reconstruction Amendments all the more remarkable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I you know, you, yeah. Uh, Please. Dred Scott left uh, a dilemma after the Civil War, which was that Dred Scott had not been overruled. You know, it still was good law by good law. I don't mean right law, mm -hmm. but I mean it was controlling law. Mm -hmm. And Dred Scott didn't only say that slaves could not be citizens. It said that black people mm -hmm. could not be citizens. Negroes, mm -hmm. in the language of the time, could not be citizens, uh, including those who were free. So something had to happen. Um, and that was part of the dilemma. That's why you get right out the box mm -hmm. the birthright citizenship clause that, and I, you all heard, we're here for nonpartisan reasons, but some folks in this country are saying we ought to abandon. Mm -hmm. Now, most people don't understand the, the real context in which that clause was created. The second thing that I wanted to mm -hmm. emphasize was that the, uh, the issue of, of uh, the ballot voting rights, that was not a civil right at the time of the adoption of the 14th Amendment. So we think of the right to vote as being protected by the 14th Amendment today in addition to the 15th Amendment, and it is. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that way then. Therefore, the necessity of the 15th Amendment mm -hmm. uh, to address the right to vote. And That's what, a preview of next year's celebration is the 15th Well, I was, I was going to say that one of, one of the ironies about the controlling influence of Dred Scott is that when Tony writes Dred Scott, he really bases his conclusions about the rights of slaveholders to take slaves into the Western territories. He actually bases it on due process mm -hmm. and privileges and immunities. Yes. So what the 14th Amendment does is, is, is in fact even more dramatic than just simply talking, all right, this is, this is now going to be the ruling definition of citizenship. That's not the only part of Dred Scott that it breaks up. It, takes head on everything that Dred Scott tried to deploy as a means for justifying slavery. And that included the way Tawney tried to use due process. And, and consider the backdrop of the amendment. After uh, the war ended, the southern states agreed to the abolition of slavery, but then immediately passed many laws that imposed all sorts of restrictions on the freed slaves, where they could go, how they could work, <laughs> what they could, could and couldn't do, that were essentially just a replication of all of the slave codes that had existed prior to 1865. So people like Bingham and the other uh, founders of Reconstruction looked at this and said, well, if this stands, then all of these men will have died in vain. W what was the point of, of the war if we're going to simply recreate the Union with slavery abolished in name only, but with uh, the freed slaves having all of these restrictions imposed upon them that basically make them little more than slaves. So there was kind of the specific evil that they were sort of concerned about and trying to target, uh, though what they were trying to do went beyond that as well. And, and you know what was the really sharp edge of that? Up until the 13th Amendment, it was still possible for slave states to claim, under virtue of the three-fifths clause, extra representation. Now, that we today look at and say it wasn't a terrible thing, three-fifths of a person. Remember that the Constitution was actually limiting the Southerners by allowing them to count only three-fifths of their slaves toward their representation in Congress. Now, with slavery abolished, Southerners can come back into the Union. They could elect their old Confederate generals and Confederate officials to Congress, which they did, 
And they would be entitled to still more representatives because now the freed slaves would be counted as five-fifths, despite the fact that those slaves had no say, those ex-slaves had no say in voting. So suddenly, this means you end the Civil War, you put down this great rebellion, you end slavery, and the South comes back into Congress stronger than it was before and with the same people. Which is why the 39th Congress, when the roll was called, mm. passed over the Southern delegations and refused uh, to seat them. But I think that, that emphasizes <coughs> John Bingham's wisdom in not just going with the Civil Rights Bill, but putting into the Constitution these protections. Because with the increased power of the South, you had the possibility that a future Congress could come in and take away all of the gains that had been so uh, hard won in that bloody Civil War. And obviously, that worked out better for some of the guarantees in the 14th Amendment than others. Certainly with citizenship, you know, constitutionalizing the conditions for citizenship made them not subject to the whims of the politics of the day, and those have remained in place, although, as Professor Shaw points out, there are and have been uh, continuous threats to the birthright citizenship rule, although they thus far haven't gone anywhere. Um, but as we know, the guarantees of liberty and equality were not an immediate reality for black Americans in the South. And many of the Reconstruction legislation um, that was put in place in order to remedy the uh, effects of uh, slavery and racial discrimination, the Freedmen's Bureau, opportunities for educational and economic um, uh, advancement were thwarted through Reconstruction. Um, would someone like to speak about that? I, I know you've written a, a book on Civil War and Reconstruction, so I'm looking to you, Professor Gelzo. You well, don't have to do it in hip hop rhyme. Well, <laughs> <laughs> bear, bear in mind, we're, we're, we focused up to this point on only one point in the 14th Amendment, and that is its first section, which is pretty potent it's a pretty good in its own one. right. But it actually does some remarkable uh, things beyond that, which again speak to the anxiety that pervaded the uh, first Congress after the Civil War, uh, that somehow the South was going to come back bigger and badder than ever before. And one of those sections, of course, is the section about the public debt. Now, reading a section of an amendment about the public debt is about as interesting as watching the grass grow. But bear in mind, what it says in that section four of the 14th Amendment is, under no circumstances whatever will the United States ever assume responsibility for the Confederate war debt. Now that's in there as an amendment to the Constitution. You might think, well, why, why an amendment to the Constitution? That, 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 that seems like overkill. No, it's not, because if those Southern representatives, now coming back, energized with that five-fifths. If they came back, renewed their alliance with Northern Democrats as they had before the war, they could pass legislation in Congress saddling the entire country with paying the debt of the Confederate States of the United States, or Confederate States of America, and thereby saddle the entire country with having to pay the bill for the people who rose up in rebellion against it. How do you like that one? Mm -hmm. that, so, that section four is actually an extremely important one. Section three talks about disabling Confederate officers, high Confederate officers, from occupying uh, positions uh, of authority, being elected to Congress. Uh, because once again, what are you going to do? You're going to take people who have fought against the nation, people like Robert E. Lee, who resigned from the army, repudiated uh, de facto the oath he had taken as a United States Army officer, fought for four years, inflicted untold casualties, and at the end of the Civil War, you're then going to turn around and say, oh, well, why don't we nominate him for governor of Virginia? Now, I would, I mean, you would look at that and say, that's incredible. What could they be thinking? People seriously proposed that. So the 14th Amendment also is addressing that, and this galaxy of questions that today, to us, don't seem to be all that pressing because they never came to fruition. But for the Congress in 1865 to 66, we're actually right on their doorstep as possibilities that could have completely upended all the results of the Civil War. I mean, imagine that. It's difficult to imagine it. It's horrible to imagine it, but it could have happened. 
So the famous story, you've, you've all probably heard it, being here in Philadelphia, when Benjamin Franklin leaves the Constitutional Convention, he's asked, what have you given us, Dr. Franklin, by a woman, and, a, and he says, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Well, in the case of the 14th Amendment, we had been given a form of creating racial justice, if we could keep it, but we didn't. Or at least we didn't for a very long time and of course are still working towards it. Now, when that happens, the question is, is that the fault of the designer of the system or the fault of those who came after? And probably the answer is some of both. Um, but you know, it's, it's easy to sort of think that maybe there was a flaw from the beginning in the way the 14th Amendment was set up. Or on the other hand, maybe one thinks that it was set up perfectly well and the problem rested with other political developments that occurred afterwards. Uh, and so I, I think that at any moment you're capable of losing achievements that have been hard fought and hard won. Uh, and so that, that's something that I think is, is one of the harder questions to, to, to answer about the 14th Amendment as to kind of why it took so long to kind of get it to a point where it really redeemed the promise that was made. And I, I, I think that that dovetails directly into several questions that we've gotten from the audience, which is that, you know, how is it that despite the Equal Protection Clause and this great language that we have in uh, the 14th Amendment that does protect equality and does protect against racial discrimination, that we then had the harsh, re-legalized uh, discrimination of Jim Crow South for so long, for so long until, thankfully, we had Section 5. We're talking about other sections of the 14th Amendment. We have Section 5 of the 14th Amendment that allows Congress to enforce the terms of the 14th <coughs> Amendment, enforce those guarantees. Um, and Professor Shaw, you litigated for many years with NAACP LDF the, the uh, legislation that was put in place by Congress to enforce the terms of the 14th Amendment and try to get rid of the vestiges of slavery as expressed through Jim Crow and uh, laws in the South. Can you speak to that a little bit? How we finally overcame the thwarting of Reconstruction uh, in the aftermath of the passage of the Reconstruction Amendments? Well, slavery wasn't cold in its grave before the Supreme Court said in uh, the civil rights cases, a challenge to um, uh, a civil rights statute, very much like the civil rights statutes of the 1960s, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, uh, that from various jurisdictions, uh, that uh, that law um, uh, was struck down. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, um, uh, the language of the civil rights cases, in part, uh, talked about how uh, there comes a time when a people recently freed from slavery, the vestiges of slavery, have to stand up on their own two feet and cease to be, quote, the special favorites of the laws, uh, end quote. Um, and in case that, that escaped anybody, it was, it was black people who were accused of being um, uh, or trying to be the special favorites of the laws. It was a, uh, uh, an argument that we would describe today as uh, what's called reverse discrimination. Uh, you know, slavery not cold in its grave uh, when the civil rights cases were decided in 1883. Uh, but the real turning point, as we know, though any of us who are students of history, was um, the contested election in 1876, uh, Hayes-Tilden, uh, which led to the withdrawal of, of uh, Southern troops from the South, the compromise that uh, led to um, President Hayes taking office as opposed to Samuel Tilden. Um, and once those troops were out, um, uh, if it wasn't clear already, and in many places it was, that the black codes were in full force, uh, and black folks weren't going to be protected. It was clear after that. Uh, and the Supreme Court began to, um, there were a few more imp opinions we could talk about, decisions that were important uh, involving jury service and other issues. But uh, 
the Supreme Court began to get out of the way, uh, and that was um, uh, that culminated with uh, the infamous decision in uh, Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, which began a long period of time uh, in which the, the 14th Amendment meant almost nothing uh, for African Americans in terms of protection from racial discrimination. Uh, that was largely true even while the 14th Amendment was used, as I indicated before, and as we know, uh, to protect uh, big business, to uh, protect employers, uh, you know, the, the right to work, which was actually a, um, you know, a right that uh, presumed that employers and employees had equal bargaining power, you know, the Lochner era. And it wasn't until the Supreme Court's decision um, uh, after the end of that Lochner era, uh, West Coast Parish Hotel uh, case, um, uh, but really the Supreme Court's decision in, in um, uh, U.S. versus Caroline Products, uh, the most famous footnote in Supreme Court history that began to set up the paradigm for enforcing the 14th Amendment with tiered scrutiny. Uh, you know, the racial discrimination receiving the highest form of scrutiny being presumptively uh, invalid, um, that we began to see some life breathed into the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. There's another story here that uh, I just want to allude to. Uh, most Americans have never heard of um, one of the lawyers who has had as much impact as any other lawyer in American history uh, on our country. Uh, Charles Houston, uh, an African-American lawyer who uh, really was uh, the individual who not only trained uh, Thurgood Marshall, mentored him, and made Howard Law School into a factory for civil rights lawyer, lawyers, uh, but also began to uh, set us on the road to Brown versus Board of Education. That's a key part of this story and the revival of life into the 14th Amendment uh, through the creation of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and uh, speaking of uh, those great lawyers, you know, we, we saw with the Brown versus Board of Education decision, the rolling back of uh, the Supreme Court's uh, grave mistake in Plessy, um, but it was really um, not that long after, as you alluded to in your earlier remarks in Bakke in the 70s, that the court um, arguably cut back on um, the uh, idea that it was, it's necessary to remedy the systemic effects of state-sanctioned intergenerational racial discrimination. And you mentioned the Fisher versus Texas case, which brings us to the present day in our 14th Amendment discussion. The Fisher case is up at the Supreme Court this term. It is yet to be decided but it has to do with uh, race conscious admissions programs at the University of Texas. And I think it's a really interesting place for us to have this conversation because it brings together a lot of different views about the continuing importance of the 14th Amendment, what it equal protection clause means. Um, I know you've spoken about the difference between the diversity rationale, which is that you want to have a racially diverse student body, um, that that's an, an important goal as opposed to the remedial uh, rationale, which is that it's important to provide access to educational opportunities because of this systemic state-sanctioned uh, racial discrimination that has been part of our history. Um, and I was wondering how you see the Supreme Court right now in this moment. You know, we've had the Roberts Court. I don't know if you all are familiar with Chief Justice Roberts' famous um, very age of Obama kind of statement that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race, and which he used in a case about schools voluntarily desegregating. Um, but there was a seem to me shift in the court last term with a surprise victory in a Fair Housing Act case that seemed to be very cognizant of the lingering effects of racial discrimination in the United States. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on where we are with the court. You talked about the error of Plessy and then the change in the court. And we're sort of again at this turning point with the Supreme Court. And I should say that Professor Shaw was a part of the administration when he taught at University of Michigan. 
uh, that came up with the uh, admissions policy that was challenged in the Supreme Court in uh, the 2003 cases, um, and part of the legal team that defended that in the Supreme Court. Well, um, I wish we could have a, a full discussion of these issues. Uh, I, you know, the, the thing that I would stress is that uh, Baki in 1978, I always say that we have to put all of this into a historical perspective. We as Americans um, are selectively um, very ahistorical. You know, mm. we have this wonderful place, we have across the mall here, um, you know, Constitution Hall, and we're very proud of all of that as the country ought to be. Um, but, you know, I often quote uh, a line from uh, the theme song to, uh, I, I date myself when I say this, uh, one of my favorite love stories. I'm a sap for love stories and uh, uh, the way we were. And there's that line, what's too painful to remember, we simply choose to forget. Mm. And that's the way we are with respect to issues of race. And so um, the reason I think historical context is so important is because Bakke's decided in 1978. Um, really, uh, about eight years after, I think we can say that the era of Jim Crow finally was ended. Um, and uh, Bakke was preceded by another case in 1974 that really raised the same kinds of issues. Bakke was medical school at the University of California. Uh, the DeFunis case was um, law school, University of Washington. The court ducked DeFunis. Um, because uh, he had been provisionally admitted pending the outcome of the case, and by the time they were going to decide it, he was about to graduate, it was moot. The point I'm really trying to underscore is us, uh, to get us to think about time. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about uh, really 350 years, um, and then you get a mere eight years, and the Supreme Court effectively throwing the remedial rationale and Bakke under the bus. Institutions can't do anything. Uh, to remedy our inequality on lines of race unless they themselves uh, were either found to have discriminated or uh, they fell on their swords. Uh, but they can't, they can't cure what's called, quote, societal discrimination, end quote. That's discrimination for which no one's responsible and there is no remedy, and we wring our hands about it, we wash our hands of it. Um, and then the court said that the 14th Amendment didn't mean anything special for African-Americans. Um, it didn't have any special significance for African-Americans. And you judge attempts to try to include people in opportunity by the same standard that you judge attempts to subordinate people based upon notions of superiority and inferiority. That, to me, was intellectually dishonest. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what the court did in Baki. Um, and what it did was come up with a, a not it, not the court, but rather Justice Powell, this diversity rationale. Um, I was on, at the Supreme Court in the courtroom when it was decided, and I left the courtroom devastated because I was very clear that for African Americans at that moment, Baki was a loss. The mm -hmm. diversity rationale, I didn't know what it was going to mean and what it would hold. Turns out that it, 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 it held up quite a bit. Um, but it really also turned African Americans into bystanders in these in these contests in the court. Uh, the subsequent cases are cases in which white people sue white institutions that are trying to diversify, um, and black folks have no voice, even though they're affected the most. Because the 14th Amendment rationale, the remedial rationale, was dead. Um, you know, and, and it was the First Amendment rationale, uh, academic freedom, uh, that carried diversity. Um, I can go on and on about this, obviously, but I, I probably quite arbitrarily should stop there, except to say <laughs> that um, these, this discourse continues today uh, in our jurisprudence. And uh, I think the 14th Amendment is a wonderful, wonderful instrument. It's important. But I also think it's been interpreted in a very um, uh, disabling manner um, and often dis... Um, well, dishonest, intellectually dishonest manner. Uh, so 
uh, it certainly brings here. home the importance of understanding the history of the 14th Amendment. And you know, I, I think that one of the, talking about the way we were, um, I think this is a great question um, uh, that requires us to get ourselves back into the head, the head space of the folks who were in the Reconstruction Congress. Um, the question is, given the controversial language of the 14th Amendment, how did they ever get it ratified? That's a good question. John they, Bingham had dirt on everyone. He managed to. You know, well, they, they kept the Republicans out. <laughs> I'm outside the Democrats out. Through through co through coercion, I mean partly uh, that is excluding the Southerners from Congress until the amendment until the s individual Southern states ratified the amendment. It was a condition that they had to meet to come back into Congress. There was also the fact that the Union Army was in place in the South to sort of persuade people to uh, go ahead and, and ratify. Now, not in the way that you might see in uh, certain countries where people are being marched at gunpoint off to the ballot box to, to vote the right way, uh, but, I mean, it was a fact of life that the Union Army was there and that there wouldn't be uh, statehood for these southern states uh, <sighs> If, if they refuse to ratify. Now, having said that, I should also add that it's not as if all northern states approved or all northern representatives approved of the language. There were northern Democrats. There were some states that even tried to repeal their previous ratifications of the 14th Amendment. Um, and it was a close run thing to say that finally it got done because, you know, at some point people lose patience with political fights in Washington, right? I mean, we <laughs> sort of see that from time to time. And so it's difficult to maintain extraordinary measures for a really long time. They did it for just long enough, or gained public support to do it for just long enough to get it ratified, but only barely. And in fact, you might say that what happened afterwards was weaker because after the amendment was ratified, the Southerners were allowed to come back in. And of course, they weren't interested in anything else uh, that was going to be done uh, to further the purposes of the amendment. Um, so a lot less could be done after that than could be done when they weren't there. Uh, so, so part of the answer was extraordinary uh, things had to, be, had to be done in order to get it ratified, which just shows you how hard it is sometimes to ratify constitutional amendments. Professor Gelzo, you get the last word. We're running out of time. One of the difficulties about determining the impact of ratification is that the ratification debates on the 14th Amendment are surprisingly spare. One of the curiosities is that unlike the ratification debates over the ratification of the Constitution, where there's a tremendous volume of literature, the 14th Amendment seems to have gone past the state legislatures with surprising lack of commentary. Uh, partly that was because by 1867, Congress had put into place in the former Confederate states a whole new governance regime under the Reconstruction Act. So that curtailed a lot of resistance to the amendment. But it, but it is even peculiar that in the northern states there was comparatively little in the way of commentary and debate. That poses a difficulty for us, because then when we go back and ask ourselves, well, what did John Bingham intend? What was the 14th Amendment supposed to do? Then it becomes very, very difficult, because we just don't have a lot in the way of evidence on the ground. I think that the 14th Amendment suffers from a history that is ambiguous. And part of the ambiguity is the fault of John Bingham, because Bingham himself gave ambiguous readings on what he thought the 14th Amendment had actually done. Was the 14th Amendment simply an attempt to bring the first eight amendments to the Constitution into federal application in the states? Well, that in some context is, is what was in view, and that's a very limited view of the 14th Amendment. Or does the 14th Amendment actually incorporate federal authority to reach into and talk about voting rights, admissions, social equality of various sorts? The evidence on that is, is really difficult to determine. 
the commentators on this, even to this day, are severely divided over whether the 14th Amendment was ever intended to incorporate uh, federal authority to the point where it could speak to uh, situations in the state or uh, in, in private uh, contexts. And I don't think we've gotten through with that debate yet. Uh, so I, I expect that the 14th Amendment, as much as it is a product of history, is not going to remain an artifact of history, but we're going to continue to debate what the role of the 14th Amendment is. And there will be court decisions one way, there will be court decisions another. Slaughterhouse cases, civil rights cases, Crookshank, these were decisions that faced in one way in interpreting the 14th Amendment. Then you come to Adamson versus California in 1947. There you have Justice Black really laying down the outlines of an incorporation doctrine. But it's, it's, it var it's going to keep on varying back and forth, and that is largely because of the ambiguities that are built into the 14th Amendment right at its very birth. Mm. Well, I think that the sweeping language of the 14th Amendment will continue to provide us with many opportunities for conversation, whether it is with the Fisher case in the Supreme Court, the marriage equality case from last term, applying the 14th Amendment um, to the case that uh, we didn't get to talk about, but is coming up in the... Uh, out of North Carolina, um, uh, HB2, about transgender uh, access and um, in North Carolina. So there are many opportunities to think about the history and legacy of the 14th Amendment. And um, I look forward to our next panel, having all the judges here, certainly kept us on our best behavior. Um, so I look forward to their conversation. But first, please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. Thank you for your thoughts. Not so shall I? Uh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to vamp for about five minutes or four minutes as our judges uh, prepare uh, for the next panel. What a great constitutional education you just heard. Um, Elizabeth just did a superb job in uh, eliciting our great panelists to summarize and elucidate all four sections of the 14th Amendment. So class, should we review some of what we just learned before the judges came in? Okay, here's, here's some of the stuff that we learned together. Uh, the first clause of the 14th Amendment talked about birthright citizenship and said that uh, in America, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. That repudiates the Dred Scott decision, which said that um, African Americans could not be citizens and have no rights, which whites were bound to respect, and define citizenship based on birth rather than blood. Then you have that clause called the Privileges or Immunities Clause, and it said that there are basic civil rights, not political rights like voting, but civil rights that are uniform from state to state. Why isn't voting uh, a civil right that's included in the 14th Amendment? Because if I live in Pennsylvania and I go to Delaware, I can't vote in Delaware elections or serve on Delaware juries, but I can make contracts that can be enforced in Delaware. So these basic civil rights, like the right to contract, to property, these economic liberties are uniform from state to state, <clears throat> but voting is not. And then there are those other two clauses which talk about uh, the right not to be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process, and the right of equal protection of the law. And we heard a moment ago that um, some of these basic privileges or immunities or civil rights included the rights that were in the first eight amendments to the Bill of Rights, prohibiting the states as well as the federal government from infringing those fundamental rights. But Professor Gelzo at the end said there's a disagreement among scholars today about how much of the Bill of Rights was incorporated against the states and what the basic privileges or immunities of citizenship are. 
And we're about to hear that there's a dispute about whether the economic liberties <coughs> that the framers considered protected should be treated at the same level as uh, personal uh, and uh, civil liberties. And then <coughs> we talked about section two of the 14th Amendment and learned, wasn't that interesting? They're so afraid of the southern states unfairly taking advantage of their African-American citizens who are not granted the right to vote and swamping Congress that apportionment in Congress is reduced for southern states that don't grant African-Americans the right to vote, but and, uh, women are thrown under the bus and the word male is inserted into the Constitution for the first time, the word of caste, C-A-S-T-E, saying, of course you don't have to grant uh, women the right to vote, uh, but um, if you don't grant it to uh, African-American males, then your apportionment will be reduced. Um, and then finally, uh, we learned about the disabilities about Southern um, uh, military leaders from joining Congress in Section 3. And finally, Section 4, which is back in the news just the other day when um, uh, uh, Mr. Trump said that uh, he might reconsider the financing of the public debt. And some commentators suggest that that might violate the part of the 14th Amendment, Section 4, that says that the validity of the public debt of the US shall not be questioned. So, wow, that was just an extraordinary constitutional education and also effective four-minute vamping on my part because I've just gotten the thumbs up from Nicandro to introduce our next panel. Uh, we, you just heard from the greatest scholars in America about the 14th Amendment, and you are now about to hear from three of the most thoughtful and distinguished judges in America. <clears throat> this is an amazing group. They are all serving on the second founding uh, advisory board, and they are three uh, extraordinary uh, federal appellate judges. You're going to meet Judge Janice Rogers Brown of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, Judge Bernice Donald of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and Chief Judge Theodore McKee of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, right across the street from the National Constitution Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Judges Rogers Brown, Donald, and McKee. Wonderful to see you. It's so glad you're here. Welcome. Great to see you, Ted. Please. I am so glad to welcome you all back to the National Constitution Center. And the last time I saw much of this group at this amazing conference that the Federal Judicial Center, which is the education arm of the federal judiciary, put on here at the Constitution Center in the fall. And Judge Je Rogers Brown gave a public uh, presentation about the 14th Amendment, and then the judges met in private session to talk about their experiences with issues of race in the courtroom and uh, applying the 14th Amendment. And it was off the record, so we're not gonna talk about the substance, except I think I can say that it was one of the most emotional and memorable discussions among judges I've ever seen, because people were talking about their personal experiences and how it related to their role as judges, and it was really electric. So I, I am just going to begin, Judge Donald. You spoke so movingly uh, in that session, and you also have had some very memorable personal experiences witnessing family and friends take place in civil rights campaigns. You were one of only four African-American students in your high school class. Tell us about how those experiences as a child with discrimination influenced your view of the 14th Amendment today. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Let me say, first of all, how honored I am to be here and taking a part in this forum. Uh, it, it, listening to the first panel and talking mm. about the history of the laws is really quite moving. Uh, and as I sat and listened, and your question reminds me, and should remind all of us, that we can have great laws, eloquent laws, laws that extol equality, but laws are not self-executing. It comes down to men and women making real and applying those laws. The first of the Brown cases, I believe, was filed in 1951. It was filed in a district court at a time when I was unborn. The Brown 54 case was decided when I was three years old. And when I began school in 1957, I began school in a two-room cinder block school 
with no running water, no indoor facilities, with grades one and two in one room and grade three in the other, with the other African-American kids going to school in a one-room black church, their classrooms were uh, arranged according to pews in the church. The older kids would bring us water down in 10-gallon pails so that the younger kids would have water to drink. And this is post-Brown. And even though the law of the land said that separate but equal is inherently unequal. Unequality was uh, a reality uh, in, my, in my life. In 1959, Mississippi, Soda County, built for the blacks a Plessy compliant school. They built a new school for the black kids so that we would not uh, have to be admitted to uh, the white school, disregarding the law. But in 1966, uh, Mississippi got the word from the federal government that they were not going to get any more education funding if they did not desegregate those facilities. And they said, okay, okay, we'll do it, but we can't do it all at once. We'll take the little kids first, and then we'll take the older grades. And so in 1967, for the first time, black kids were allowed to go to the white school. And it was a hostile environment, and I, along with three other African-American women, went to the white school. I will tell you that it was amazingly hostile because we were not welcome. Even though the law said we should be there, the environment was not welcoming. And so we were in a school, physically there and present, but still segregated in our interactions and with teacher involvement. Uh, so that time for me was very difficult. And I will say two other things and then I'll stop talking. In 1967, when I went there, uh, along with those three other women, we actually faced uh, physical hostility at times because we people wanted us to go back to our schools. And the teachers were not, um, well, apparently were told not to give any of the African American students any information about college or provide no counseling services. And so when I graduated as an honor student in 1969, even though I earned college scholarships, my counselor told me more than a decade later how much she regretted the fact that she could not communicate that information to me. So even though I had earned that, I had to find a way to get myself to college and pay for it, notwithstanding what happened then. And so when people talk about the distance we've come, yes, we've come a great distance. But notwithstanding the law of the land, we still found those practices of inequality and overt discrimination and overt exclusion in my lifetime. Uh, I am hopeful that we will come to a day when we really can look at all people as equal and, and deal with each other uh, on a person-to-person -person level. But unfortunately, we're not there yet. And while the situation that I encountered is, is perhaps different now, we are now in schools more segregated, at least in the high school and elementary schools, than we were in 67 when I went to that school. Remarkable. Um, Judge Rogers Brown, uh, Judge Donald, like the previous panelists, have talked about the struggles of the, to fulfill the promise of the amendment to achieve racial equality. But the amendment was also intended to achieve economic liberty and economic equality. And you have spoken very powerfully here at the Constitution Center and elsewhere about how that promise of basic economic liberties was a boon to uh, African Americans. Um, and the court initially enforced it, it came, but it's, in your view has come to do less so today. Is the promise of economic liberty a, a more positive uh, story of the 14th Amendment? And tell us how you think it is important to guaranteeing civil equality today. <laughs> a small question, but you've, you've been very powerful about this, and I want to hear your thoughts. Well, it's, it was really fascinating uh, to hear that story, because I, um, um, I'm a little older, I, I'm sorry to say, but <laughs> I'm a little older than she is, and so I, I do remember um, uh, the, the same sorts of things that when Brown v. the board was decided and so forth. Um, and I guess, you know, kind of following along with that, um, we did 
did have a, I guess, Plessy compliant school. Uh, I was born in Alabama. Uh, and in Alabama, I went to uh, a school called the Crenshaw County Training School, which was the, the segregated school for black students at that time. When I tell people that, they often say to me, were you in reform school? <laughs> you know, I mean, it sounds kind of odd, uh, but that was their way of saying that we could be trained but not educated. Uh, but so that re, you know, makes me think about all of the things, um, all of the ways in which uh, we have tried to figure out what's necessary um, to solve the problem uh, of you know, having had slavery in, in this country. At the time of the 14th Amendment, um, there was concern about economics, not necessarily the idea of economic liberty as we sort of think about it now, but the fact that, the, the, you know, we were, we've been talking about the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment and why that needed to be done. And one of the problems, uh, one of the ways that the Republicans at that time thought about this problem and that Lincoln thought about this problem was the right of a man, a human being, to own himself. In other words, uh, this was the principle that slavery violated. Uh, what they were saying is it cannot possibly be the case that it is okay to take away from somebody their right to own themselves, their labor, the work of their hands. And so for them, uh, in part, that was what freedom meant. And so the 13th Amendment, which just said slavery is abolished, uh, was to some people a way of saying, well, that takes care of that. People now own themselves. They have the right to contract. They said what those uh, rights of citizenship were then. So right, to, to, go, to make contracts, to uh, own your own property, to do, as you wanted to do. Now, a lot of other things they left out of that because they considered them not to be civil rights, but political rights or social rights. So they distinguished that. They had a very clear line on um, economic rights. And so that was one of the things that they included, I think, in privileges and immunities. As you've heard, you know, a lot of that fell by the wayside. Uh, but that idea of, you know, Free soil, they said, uh, free men, free labor. That was kind of uh, the way that they thought about it. And that really is a legacy um, from the 14th Amendment. Now, you've probably also heard uh, that there is a big uh, controversy uh, which continues about whether or not those kinds of rights are significant. And there is a period in our uh, jurisprudence where we kind of separate uh, the idea of civil rights and even political rights from economic rights. So I think that's what, <laughs> uh, what, what Jeff is, is talking about, is that after Caroline Products, the court sort of said, well, you know, there are some really important rights, uh, sort of what's in the Bill of Rights and that sort of thing, but economic rights are sort of, you know, second class rights. We don't worry about them as much. Um, there are all kinds of reasons for that dichotomy. I don't happen to think uh, it's a particularly useful one. I happen to have a lot of sympathy with the idea uh, of the people who were looking right at the beginning and saying, uh, what is really important uh, is to own yourself, to be able to take care of your family, to be able to do uh, what you need to do to earn your living, um, and so those kinds of rights are very important. The courts now don't view them the same. So. That's beautifully said. And this uh, question is going to be the subject of our seminar for next year. Judge Fogel and I are going to try to bring you all back here to talk about whether this post-New Deal understanding that economic rights should be given lesser protection than civil rights uh, should be reexamined. And I can't wait for that conversation. Uh, Chief Judge McKee, um, both of your colleagues have first of all told a little bit about their personal experiences and their education and how that's influenced their outlook in applying the 14th Amendment. And you in particular have written about 
the pervasiveness of uh, implicit bias and how the fact that we are all prisoners of our perspectives and experiences and that can affect the way people apply the law in the courtroom. So tell us about your own uh, education and how that led you to your views about implicit well, bias. Well, I was actually thinking about that as, as my colleagues were speaking. I did not grow up in the South. I grew up in a small town outside of Rochester, New York, about as far upstate, uh, far north as you can get. You're going further north, either in Lake Ontario or in Canada. Um, in, in my town, uh, there were only, it was a very small town, there were only about four or five black families counting mine. But I had a very similar situation in, in high school. Uh, I wasn't a, 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 a Phi Beta Kappa kind of student in high school, but I did very well. And actually, ironically, later on, I worked in admissions for the State University of New York for three years. And then when, when I was there, I understood how you can package someone's strengths. And when I saw that, I thought, well, damn, I was, I was pretty competitive for college. I was president of the student council. I was a varsity athlete in three sports um, and a solid B student. And I had incredibly strong letters of recommendation. Despite that, when I went into my guidance counselor at the beginning of my senior year and told her that I wanted to talk to her about uh, going to college, she began to speak to me about two-year schools that I should apply to. And she said, you know, Ted or Teddy, as I was known in my school, <clears throat> I really am not sure that it's realistic for you to think about a four-year school. You maybe should think about enrolling in a, um, a bachelor's program, an associate's program. And I was very handy with my hands. I twirled leather as a kid, uh, starting when I, I third or fourth grade. And I had these really nice briefcases, better than anything any of my teachers had. And so she knew I liked to work with my hands, so she suggested that I go into ornamental horticulture. I don't know what the hell that was. Um, <laughs> I went home and I told my dad, and um, this was in uh, upstate New York. It was really cold. I think it was, it's always cold up there. I think it was the end of September, and it was probably frost on the ground, probably 30 degrees. Uh, we didn't have a car, but dad got on his bicycle, and he rode up to the high school about a mile and a half, and he came back two hours later, and he said, Mrs. Putnam, we'll see you tomorrow morning, first thing. And I said, I had basketball practice first thing in the morning. And my dad, he was the first black person to play high school basketball in the state of Indiana. Dad was driven for athletics. And for me to think that dad was thinking that I should miss basketball practice, this, I mean, this was momentous. So I said, well, dad, I've got basketball practice. And he said, the hell with basketball practice. You go see Mrs. Putnam. So I thought, this is, I go in to see Mrs. Putnam, and she's got all this stuff laid out on her desk for me. Uh, schools that we couldn't possibly afford to get into, Cornell and afford to go to Cornell and Yale and Harvard, totally unrealistic. So I don't know if that was her way of setting me up to fail or what that was about. But on my own, I was able to um, look at schools that financially we could afford, the State University of New York. And I went there and was successful. And when I went to law school, I graduated uh, with honors in the top 10 students in my class. And when I was relating this student to somebody who was very close to me, she still is my high school English teacher, Two days after graduation, she said, Ted, you should take the program from your graduation and send it to Mrs. Putnam and underline the part where it says your order of the coif, which is kind of the law school equivalent of Phi Beta Kappa. My wife, very similar experience. She went to school in New York City. And by the way, that is to say, I don't think that Mrs. Putnam uh, would identify herself as a racist, and she would probably thought she was trying to help me out by getting into a good two-year program where I could succeed. Uh, it just wasn't part of her reality or her perception of me that I was one day going to go on and be an honor graduate from a law school. She didn't see me that way. Uh, and I think that was the subliminal kind of mind bug that, that Jeff was suggesting in the question. My wife, and it's very much akin to what you're talking about, going to her guidance counselor. She started going to her guidance counselor, she told me, in her junior year of high school, asking for information about colleges. She was also always told, I don't have any information, I don't have any information. And some of you may remember, some of this was during the teacher strike in New York City. So the, the schools were shut down. She was going to Columbus High School at the time. Um, one day, she happened to go in, and she asked for any information. And there were a group of students meeting in a conference room off to the side. And they're all white students. Uh, and the guidance counselor said, well, I'm sorry, I don't have any information. And she turned to leave. And the guidance counselor, and there's a long story, ironic story, serendipitous story that I won't get into here. Uh, the, the guidance counselor who's in there goes, well, wait a minute. That's the guess, exactly the kind of student that I am trying to uh, interest in school. I want to speak to her. So she goes in. She sits down and she meets. Guidance counselor turned out to be from the State University of New York at Binghamton. Uh, Harper College, I guess, as it was then known, which was one of the crown jewels of the SUNY system. 
She ends up going to SUNY. A few years later, she went on to medical school and uh, ended up on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania uh, Med School. She's now a very, very accomplished uh, internist with a national organization, uh, pretty much in charge of setting patient safety standards in all hospitals, 90% of the hospitals across the United States and, and doing some work internationally. And this is somebody that her guidance counselor could not help her get into college. She wasn't dissuaded the way mine was, but it was the same kind of, of thing. The guidance counselor didn't see her as somebody who was worthy of being um, helped into college. And it's there, and it's an unfortunate fact of life. We see it playing out in very, very many facets. And so you don't have to be a product of a Mississippi or an Alabama educational system. I am a product of a upstate New York educational system. My wife is the product of a New York City educational system. The same kind of, in a very different kind of manifestation, in a way I think your manifestation was much more destructive than mine, because I didn't have the same kind of hostility or violence. As I said, I was the president of my student body. I didn't have the same kind of hostility to deal with on a daily basis. <clears throat> um, and I, thinking back on it, I'm not even sure I was aware of it, what was going on until Dad told me, forget the damn basketball practice, go in and see Mrs. Putnam. And then I said, well, you know, there's something going on here. If Dad wants me to miss basketball practice. Um, but at the time, I, it didn't hit me. So in a way, I had it a lot easier than both of my colleagues did. But the same poison um, was there. And if we have time, I wanted to hit on the privileges and immunities thing, because that is something that goes to the economic uh, benefits of, uh, of what freedom means. The, and and uh, Professor Shaw said it beautifully, that the slavery was not cold in its grave when the um, forces began to be incarnated. There was a case that was touched upon during the prior discussion, uh, two cases. One, the slaughterhouse cases, where the privileges and immunities clause of the Fourth Amendment, uh, 14th Amendment was basically read out of the 14th Amendment. It's still being read out of the 14th Amendment. It's pretty much a dead letter. But it basically guaranteed everyone the privileges and immunities of citizenship. There was no meat put on that bone to define what those privileges and immunities were. But I'd submit to you that if we had a viable privileges and immunities jurisprudence today, we would not be as tied to finding remedies through the Commerce Clause as we are now in order for Congress to legislate in an area. It almost has to be something which touches upon uh, interstate commerce, and Congress has the authority to legislate there because of its powers under the Commerce Clause in the Constitution. The Privileges and Immunities Clause does the same thing. I think it's much, much broader, but the Supreme Court read it out of the 14th Amendment in the slaughterhouse cases. And then, and, and I'll just say this one more thing and then I'll, I'll stop. Uh, a few years after that, uh, 10 years after that, the Civil Rights cases that you heard mentioned of, uh, there was an act passed in 1866, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which did attempt to put flesh on the bones of what does citizenship mean. Incredibly comprehensive, and it guaranteed that there'd be no discrimination based upon race in almost every area of life that you can imagine. Contracts, public accommodations, um, public uh, uh, thoroughfares, subway, well, they didn't have subways then, but on the public carriers. Um, it did not touch on intermarriage, but a lot of states were passing uh, statutes then allowing folks to, to intermarry of different races. The, uh, there were several cases that were consolidated where, in one case, someone was def uh, refused, the black woman was refused service at a restaurant, another person was refused entrance into a on an equal footing into a, a, a movie theater. And these cases were all brought together nationally. The plaintiffs were arguing that the, 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 the defense against the statute, because it also imposed criminal penalties, which we don't see now, for denying someone equal protection. The defendants argued that the Civil Rights Act was unconstitutional because it um, interfered with, uh, it, it was beyond the scope of the federal government, that the federal government did not have the authority to legislate and pass legislation in these kinds of personal individual actions where there was no state action involved. Um, and the Supreme Court basically agreed and struck down the Civil Rights Act uh, of 1866, and it wasn't until another 100 years until we got the Civil Rights, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. And in doing that, they basically wrote out again the Privileges and Immunities Clause. If that clause were there, all of the kinds of things that I mentioned arguably are privileges and immunities of citizenship. Not necessarily because they're defined in the Constitution, but they're not. But if one person who is a citizen can enjoy a benefit, be it an economic or a social or a political right, and another person is denied that benefit based upon color, you can argue 
that that latter person is being denied a privilege and immunity of citizenship as defined by someone else who's entitled to enjoy that. And without that, we're then locked into, as I said, the, the Commerce Clause. And I could go on for a while on that, but I really want to stop because I don't want to hog the conversation. Well, you've just raised uh, a question which thrills the heart of any constitutionalist, and I see Judge Ur nodding too, which is the suggestion that the slaughterhouse cases were wrongly decided when they read the Privileges or Immunities Clause out of the Constitution and reduced it to a dead letter. So Judge, I want to ask you to take up um, Chief Judge McKee's uh, suggestion. Imagine the slaughterhouse cases had come out the other way, and we did have a robust Privileges and Immunities Clause. The judge suggested that would have empowered Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act and do all sorts of stuff. Do you think, uh, do you agree? Would it have constrained Congress in other ways, creating economic liberties that might have uh, called into question some federal statutes today? How would the world look different if the Privileges or Immunities Clause were actually enforced? Wow. Well, I wish I had had a chance to really uh, think about this before this moment, but I. <laughs> Law professor's hypothetical. But yeah, <laughs> but, but. Uh, I was just nodding my head because I really feel strongly that um, had we not had lost the Privileges and Immunities Clause, um, we would, the trajectory of, the, you know, of, of our um, jurisprudence here, I think would have been so different um, because of the way uh, that that was just really uh, read out of um, the, the uh, 14th Amendment and because uh, of the emphasis on state action, which followed that, with a very, very different kind of jurisprudence. And it meant that um, ultimately we had to, the uh, equal protection and due process had to then carry so much uh, weight. And eventually then, when we got to trying to undo de jure segregation, uh, then the Commerce Clause had to carry all that weight. And it just seems to me that uh, we might have been arguing about completely different things. And we might, in fact, uh, never have had some of the problems uh, that we had later on trying to do this. For one thing, we would have been a hundred years further along. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's, it, I, I, I mean, I don't know exactly what that would have looked like, but I feel certain that it would have been quite different. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Judge, judge please, yeah. Uh, please, I, please take I up just, privileges and immunities, and I have another question after. Well, I, I wanted to say a couple of things, and I want to go back. Uh, to some of the things that the first panel mentioned and, and how we got there. You know that, and our audience may know that, uh, after the war um, and after the passage of the 13th Amendment, many of the southern states, and even though Tennessee's sort of a borderline southern state, didn't take well to the presence of all of these newly free people um, and in Memphis, there was a place where they particularly did not take well to that. And so there was, in 1866, just an outright massacre of a number of African Americans in that community because of resentment to, first of all, African American soldiers who were there in their uniforms, this whole new freedom, a belief that people would sort of rise up and um, consider themselves equal to white residents there, that they would challenge the culture. And, and as I said before, there was a, 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 literal, a literal massacre. And eventually, federal troops had to come back in and try to restore order. Congress held hearings. And, and really, they saw at that time, I think the radical Republicans saw that the things that they feared about the uh, newly freed people uh, being denied that status and being treated really in a paternalistic way were a real reality, because it was evidenced right there through those actions. People were at that time uh, denied opportunity to have certain types of, of employment, but yet were penalized when they did not work. They could be arrested. They could, even after um, 1865, they could not go into court and testify about grievances and injuries that they, that they suffered. And so uh, this whole notion of being uh, a citizen but having none of those protections 
I think the, um, the Congress actually saw that that sort of advanced the cause and other times in ways that sort of retarded progress. Uh, but you know, we, we will continue to try and that uh, are jurors impartial when he walked in 30 days later he came back with an African American defense attorney In, in your didn't do my blood pressure medicine this morning. <laughs> um, but what he did was he, he found there was more characteristic blacker features. They had a demonstrably and statistically greater. Try not to identify with or are afraid of, um, not, not be threatened by the fact that it's there, not be defensive by the fact that it's there. I have it, we all have it, be honest about it, and then try to see what we can do to deal with it. I think the shooter. young fish who are swimming along in a very different place. One of the changed your colleagues' mind and have they changed yours? I think I have. I mean I think there have been times when um, they just because it they don't see things in a particular way. Um, and if you just say to them, but if you've ever had this experience, or you know, I can tell you without l looking any further, if I see a certain set of facts, I can that the I think that so many things are still going to be determined uh, by that, and we will continue to have to negotiate this issue, I think, for the foreseeable future. And I, I, I would love to know how we get to you. They don't think about it. It's not part of their consciousness. It's not what they're into. Um, and so I don't think it's quite perhaps as dire as it may seem. Now, I, I grant you that what's going on with multiculturalism and the sort of balkanization of the country now is very distressing and very disturbing. Um, and I hope that is not devolution. I mean, I hope we're not moving back from something when we, when we were seeing a way forward. But so I just wanted to say, I, I, I actually on this subject, I don't feel quite as pessimistic. <laughs> well, I think I'm it's delighted that you ended on a note of optimism. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our wonderful judges. <laughs>